Now we're moving on to chapter five. Chapter five is all about chemical bonding. Chemical bonding is really the link between, on the one hand, structure, which we've already talked about, and on the other hand, the properties of materials. To understand the properties of many materials, we're going to have to think about what's called the electronic band structure. And uh, when I first started teaching this class many years ago, we kind of jumped kind of right into this electronic band structure. But what I realized after teaching this one or two times is that really students needed a little refresher on chemical bonding. And that's particularly true for those of you who might not be chemistry majors. Our first foray into the world of bonding is going to deal with ionic bonding. After this, we're going to talk about atomic orbitals and then covalent bonding. So the idea of ionic bonding is a very simple, if not terribly realistic one. We are going to treat our crystal as a collection of point charges. So if we're talking about a crystal of potassium fluoride, we're going to assume the potassium ions are plus one point charges and the fluoride ions are minus one point charges. And then we're just going to calculate the electrostatic interactions between these charges, the Coulomb interaction. The basis for this is the equation given on this slide, which tells us the energy of two interacting point charges. So in the numerator, we just multiply the magnitudes of the charges. So when we say plus one, we really mean plus one times the charge of an electron. So E here is the charge of an electron, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And then we're going to divide by 4 pi E naught, which is sometimes called the electric constant, sometimes called the permittivity of free space, times the distance between the charges. We can see a few things just from this very simple equation. We can see that if we have a cation and an anion, one has a positive charge, one has a negative charge, and so the energy is negative. That is, it's attractive. Um, if the charges are the same, either anion or anion, or cation or cation, then this entire term is going to become positive. So we're going to have a positive energy, and that means that the ions are going to be repelled from each other. If we put two cations close together, you know, they're going to move away from each other, decreasing the energy until, in principle, the energy goes to zero. We can also see something about the magnitude of the interaction here. The larger the charges, the larger the energy of this interaction. And the closer together the charges, the larger the interaction. Now, because the Coulomb energy has a 1 over distance dependence, it means that Coulomb interactions, even at quite long distances, cannot be neglected. Now that we have this energy term for the energy of two interacting point charges, all we really need to do is look at our crystal and sum up all of these pairwise interactions. So here is a crystal of, of the rock salt structure. Let's say it's sodium chloride. This would give us the energy of interaction between any pair of charges. And if we were to, let's say, start on the chloride ion at the center of the unit cell and look at the successive shells of neighbors as we move out from that central ion. So the nearest neighbors are six sodium ions that are in an octahedron. Six in the numerator, because there are six such interactions. And the distance here from the chloride to the sodium is just going to be 1 times the interatomic distance. Then let's look at the second nearest neighbors. So the second nearest neighbors are actually going to be these chloride ions that sit on the edges of the unit cell. All right, and there are 12 such neighbors, so our numerator here is a 12, and the distance from here to here, it's longer than the distance was here to here. And with a little trigonometry, you can say, well, that's a 45 degree triangle. And the hypotenuse of a 45 degree triangle is square root two longer than the edge. 
All right, so the distance is square root 2 times d. And importantly, we have a different sign here. Right? The second nearest neighbor is going to be a repulsive interaction. And if we have Z1 being positive for the sodium and Z2 being negative for the chloride, you know, the term in front is going to be negative. So we need this negative sign here so that the second nearest neighbor shell produces a positive energy, that is a repulsive energy. We can look at the third nearest neighbors, which are the sodium ions that are at the corners of the unit cell. Uh, there's eight of those neighbors, and the distance now you can show is square root 3 times d. You can keep going to larger and larger shells, and, and you get this series. Now, what we really want is we want to take that series all the way out to infinity and see what it converges to. Uh, and if you do that summation correctly, you can show that for this crystal structure, sodium chloride, this converges to a value of 1.7476 to five significant figures. And we call that the Madelung constant for the sodium chloride structure type. That value, 1.748, out to four significant figures, works for any compound that has the rock salt structure. But what happens if we have a different structure type? What if it's cesium chloride or verdsite or zinc blend? So for every different arrangement of atoms, you know, you have different shells of neighbors and you get a different Madelung constant. And this table shows the Madelung constants for eight ionic structure types. So what we see are some trends when we look at the table. So if we look at those compositions that have a one-to-one -one ratio of anions to cations, you can see that the Madelon constant goes down a little bit when you go from eight coordinate in cesium chloride to six coordinate in sodium chloride. It goes down substantially more when we go to the four coordinate that we get in zinc blend and wurzite. What we see from this is something that I told you back in chapter one without any justification. That is, if we want to maximize the ionic bonding, then what we want to have are generally symmetric structures, and we want to have a high coordination number. Now, when we go to uh, compounds with a one to two ratio, you know, the Madelung constant jumps up here because there's now more ions in the empirical formula. But we do still see the same trends in coordination number. As the cation goes from 8 coordinate in calcium fluoride to 6 coordinate in TiO2 rutile to 6 coordinate in the cadmium chloride and cadmium iodide structures, you can see that the Madelung constant is going down. The other thing that we see, which is notable, and if you think about it, not surprising, the last three entries on the right-hand side here all have six-coordinate cation and a three-coordinate anion. Yet, the Madelung constants for calcium chloride and calcium iodide are noticeably smaller. And the reason is, in the rutile structure, we're trying to spread out the octahedral holes that are filled. Whereas, remember, in the cadmium chloride and cadmium iodide structure, we have sort of close-packed array of anions, and then the cations fill all of the octahedral holes in one layer, and then none of the octeter holes in the next layer. So we have not separated our cations as much as geometry would allow. That means there's more cation-cation repulsions in these layered cadmium chloride and cadmium iodide structures than in the three-dimensional rutile structure. And that makes the Madelon constant lower. In the next lecture, we'll talk a little bit about what kinds of forces actually stabilize those layered structures. Okay, let's define the lattice energy. Uh, and lattice energy, depending on what textbook you look at, might be defined in a couple of different ways. Here we're going to define the lattice energy as the energy that's released when we take cations and anions that are at infinite separation in the gas phase and allow them to come together and condensed into a solid phase. Notice that this process is going to be an exothermic process, so we're going to release energy the lattice energy should be negative. And in a minute, we're going to talk about you know, methods of experimentally 
determining the lattice energy. And those methods are largely going to give us the lattice enthalpy. Now, the difference in a solid between the enthalpy and the internal energy is pretty small. It's maybe a couple of kilojoules per mole at, say, room temperature. And the book talks a little bit more about it. But for all practical purposes, we can treat these as being basically equivalent within the kinds of errors that we're going to see with these calculations we're going to build up to. So, how do we calculate the lattice energy? Well, over here on the left, we've got our expression that we've already derived for the electrostatic energy of a collection of point charges that are arranged in a certain structure type. Okay, so that energy is in general going to be negative. What this equation, though, does not take into account is there are actually some repulsions caused by overlap of the electrons in core orbitals. One way to realize that is if you look at the equation over on the left, you can see that the lattice energy is going to get more and more favorable, that is more and more negative, as the distance between the ions gets shorter and shorter. But we know in practice that the ions don't collapse on top of each other. There's something that keeps the distance from getting too short, and that is the quantum mechanical repulsions between uh, the core electrons. We're just going to approximate that with this exponential function. So here B is just an empirical constant, and rho is also another empirical constant, although we're going to set rho to be 0.345 angstroms. And so then if we know the distance between two ions, we can calculate the repulsive energy between them. See, so this is going to be a positive number, and this uc, the coulombic energy of the lattice, is going to be negative. Now we can combine these two, and we get you know, this expression. Now, the problem with this expression is we don't know the value of our empirical constant B. Everything else we know, right? A is the Madelung constant, remember. We're setting rho to be 0.345. We've got these distances here. So what we could do, though, is we could plot the Coulomb energy uh, as a function of distance. right? And the closer together the ions get that becomes more and more negative. And then up here we plot the repulsive energy, uh, that's the repulsion between these core electrons, and you see that at long distances that's negligible uh, because it's an exponential function. But once we start to bring them too close together, that function rises sharply. So if we add the two of them together, we find that we reach a minimum. Okay, and the minimum occurs at a certain distance, which we're going to call d naught. Right, so if we go back to our expression now, and let's take the derivative of the lattice energy as a function of the distance d, and set that equal to zero. Right? So the derivative of a function set to zero is how we could find the minimum. And if we do that, we would get this expression. Right? 1 over d, what's the derivative of that? minus 1 over d squared. So we get a minus sign out here. This becomes d squared. The derivative of e to the minus d over rho is e to the minus d over rho times 1 over rho. And we've also then plugged in for d, we plugged in uh, d naught. That would be the bond distance at the minimum of the lattice energy. And so we can now solve for b. And when we plug B back in, we get this expression. And this expression is called the Born-Meyer equation. So we can use this to calculate the lattice energy of an ionic compound. Now let's ask a question. What do we need to know to use the Born-Meyer equation? Well, we need to know the charges of the ions. That's pretty easy. We need, here's this Avogadro's number. We need the charge of an electron. Those are just physical constants. 4 pi e naught. That's the permittivity of free space, another physical constant. And then uh, we need to know A is the Madelung constant, and then d naught is the equilibrium distance between ions. So where are we going to get that? Well, we can use ionic radii, and we can add up 
the radii of the anion plus the cation, and we're going to use that to come up with our distance. Given that, we can calculate the lattice energy of an ionic compound.